I am Nancy Noyes Silcox, and um, I was the first librarian at Samuel Tucker Elementary School when it opened in 2000. It was the first school that Alexandria City Schools opened in 30 years, and I was lucky enough to be the first librarian. Well, it was a little roundabout. Um, my mother was a teacher, and um, I think she would have liked me to be a teacher as well. And of course, being a child at the time, I said, no way, I was going to be doing that. And um, But then I ended up being a public librarian in Arlington County. That was my the beginning of my career. And um, I was there for eight years. And then um, my husband got a job in Egypt, and that was in 1980, and off we went to Egypt. And there I was fortunate enough to um, become the elementary librarian at an international school. And that, for the next 10 years, that started me on a, a path of being school librarians in um, middle, a middle school, high school in Belgium um, after we finished the almost five years in Egypt. But I realized at that point that I really liked the work of a school librarian more than I liked what public librarians did. I mean, they're both... Uh, valuable, you know, occupations, but, but the work is very different. In a, in a school, you can follow a student for at least five years in an elementary school, five years, six years, depending on the configuration of the school. But, um, you have a chance to see them learn and grow and uh, mature that you don't have necessarily in a public library. Um, so when I came back to the States in 1989, um, I applied with Alexandria schools and I was hired at Lyle's Crouch School, and then I went to John Adams, and then my husband took a job in Ukraine, and I took a two-year leave of absence and was gone for the two years, and then when I was ready to come back in 2000, it, again, was just my good fortune that um, Tucker was opening, and they hired me as the um, first librarian here in this space, which is an incredible space. I did. Um, it's kind of interesting that I had nothing to do with the space. The space was designed early in the design process. But um, when I was hired in March, um, I was tasked with ordering the first collection um, of the books and videos. Somebody else was ordering all the computers and software. But I've never had so much money as a librarian to spend <laughs> in a library. But I'm, the shelves were empty. And so yeah. when we got here in September, um, it was bookshelves, and then the boxes of books began to arrive, and, and we put them on the shelves. But I had with me, when I went back to Ukraine, the uh, standards of learning, you know, on a floppy disk, or it was a stiffy disk at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember yeah. that terminology? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I had the Alexandria curriculum, and I used that to find books through a jobber that um, would support the things that teachers were teaching. And then I also emailed all of the new teachers asking them what books they wanted to find in the collection when they arrived. And that's what I used as my basis for ordering the books. Then I kept out some money um, to fill in the holes and, and you know, pay for things that we knew we needed that I hadn't gotten earlier. Um, right. But it was a one, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity yeah. to, to have this experience of setting up a new library yeah. in a new school. I knew nothing, as most people in Alexandria. Um, and the sit-in was a little-known story. Um, but Kathy David, who was the first principal of the school, uh, made it very clear that all the Tucker students would know who Samuel W. Tucker was and what he did and the significance of the sit-in. Um, and so there was age-appropriate information available to all the teachers, and all the kids were taught what what happened in 1939 and, and why Tucker was such an incredible person. It uh, resonated with me because um, the sit-in was a, 
uh, a protest against segregation in a public library. And I had come from public libraries. And public mm -hmm. libraries are supposed to be places where you can educate yourself. And there was a group of Alexandria citizens who were not given the right to do that. We're not allowed to do that. And so the fact that the sit-in was in a public library, um, that, that really made a difference with me. It was a long um, process of just mulling over what, what had happened. And um, I never intended to write a book. Um, and it was shortly before I retired that um, there was an article in the Washington Post that someone else wrote about Tucker. And it gave more about his life. And, and by then, I'd, um, I mean, one of the things that I loved doing as a school librarian is, was teaching um, kids how to do research and how to find mm -hmm. answers to their questions. And so I knew the kinds of questions that they asked and, and some of the things that they couldn't find in, in regular biographies. And so I continued to, the, the seed was planted and it just needed to grow a little bit. <laughs> um, but I kept thinking that, you know, somebody needs to write a biography about this remarkable man um, so that kids have a way of knowing more about him. Um, because we basically taught them just about the sit-in, but nothing really about the rest of his life. And he, <clears throat> he did incredible things um, throughout his career as a lawyer to desegregate public schools in Virginia. Um, and that really, that really wasn't a part of the story here, um, as I remember. But I thought kids need to know that too. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I lived with this idea for a while, I finally began to think, well, if you know, nobody else is writing this biography, maybe I should try to do it because I know what good kids nonfiction should look like. And um, I know how to do research. I've been teaching kids how to do research. Mm -hmm. I should maybe do this myself. And so once I retired and I was looking around for something to do, because um, I like projects. And uh, so I, I thought, well, let me try do it my, to do it myself. And, and now we have the result. Um, well, I say it took me about nine months in, in during two years to actually research and write it. Um, and in the beginning, um, I think I'd retired by then. And in the beginning, um, I wanted more specifically to know what kids wanted to know about Tucker. So I came back to um, a third grade class and I asked mm -hmm. them. Um, and they wanted to know, you know, things that didn't surprise me. But they wanted to know, you know, things about his family, who his um, siblings were, um, what did his parents do? Did he have a dog? You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. But then there was one third grader who asked me, or because he remembered um, that in third grade, he'd learned that Thurgood Marshall was the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. That was one of the SOLs for first grade. And this third grader remembered it and asked me, was, and I told them that, that Tucker had argued a case, a, a school desegregation case before the Supreme Court. And the student asked me if Thurgood Marshall was on the Supreme Court when Tucker's case was heard. And I'm going, wow. I, I said, I don't know. I don't know. Because I believe that if you don't know something, you don't make it up and, you know, you're honest with kids. And I said, but I will find out and I'll put the answer in the book. And I did. And the answer is in the book because a third grader asked the question. There are no questions that are too insignificant. So, um, I started like that. And then, um, and then I researched a lot. Um, and then I came back to another fourth grade class with things that I'd written just to check out the reading level and to see if um, they could find answers to the questions, you know, in the text that I'd written. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was writing in a way that was easy for kids to understand the element, upper elementary and, and middle school. And um, it turned out that you know, they were able to do it. So I was confident that I could continue writing, you know, in that style. Um, well, one thing I, I spent a lot of time on um, f with the advice of, of uh, 
some reading specialists at, at Tucker, actually. Um, I eliminated idioms from my writing, and I realized that I was writing um, a lot of passive sentences. I needed to change all of those to active sentences. I needed to have short sentences, strong nouns, strong verbs. Um, and, um, and we also had a very large um, uh, English language learner population at Tucker. So I knew I couldn't use words that you know, were beyond the understanding and the experience of, of the kids in the upper elementary. And, and then in middle school. And then also, um, I knew that um, the fourth grade studied Virginia history and had a civil rights component, and seventh grade had US history, and there was a civil rights component there. So I was targeting those two grade levels too and hoping that it could be used in both of those grade levels. Well, nothing was impossible, um, except that um, I, I wish that I had started my, my research earlier. Because by the time I started my research, um, all the people, most of the people who knew Tucker um, were no longer living. Um, his sister was alive to her dedication in 2000, but I didn't start writing until, or working on this in 2011. And so um, there were there weren't people I could talk to about it. I had to rely on other things. And fortunately, um, Audrey Davis at the Alexandria Black History Museum had files of materials about Tucker and the sit-in. And it was um, newspaper clippings. It was uh, personal memorabilia that I, I believe his wife um, made copies of and, and donated. Um, but somebody saw the value of this material and saved it and they, um, they kept it. And then the librarians at the Special Collections Department in the um, Alexandria Public Library, um, again, they had materials that I could use and Alexandria directories that were just invaluable. But the most value was um, videotaped interviews that were done in 1985 by a University of Virginia professor. And the University of Virginia digitized them and they're available on the library's website. And just when I needed to use that material, there it was, and I could sit at my computer at home and and listen to Tucker, um, but five, for five and a half hours, and I listened to it over and over again because I wanted to um, capture his his voice, his way of speaking. He had a very quiet, thoughtful way of speaking, uh, deliberate, but very determined. And um, so I used words that he used. I put you know, some of his words in the book so that it was easier to get a flavor for what he was really like, his personality. And then um, his brother Otto and William Evans, who was, um, the two of them were some of the protesters, um, they were also interviewed. And so there again, it was just a, a wealth of information. Um, but I found all kinds of unexpected things. Um, one of the um, the unexpected paths that I traveled was um, late in my research process. I, I'd started writing it and I realized I needed to know more about his mother who grew up on a farm near Midland, Virginia, out in Fauquier County. And um, uh, so I went out to Midland to see what it looked like. And it, there's a railroad track that goes through the town. There are just a few little houses and there was a store. And I um, went into the store and there was a woman there who was you know, in charge of it. And I told her what I was doing and what I was working on. And she looked at me and she said, you know, that sounds an awful lot like the story that my, my friend Sandra always talks about her relative. Well, it turned out that Sandra, her friend, um, was one of Tucker's relatives. Her grandmother was Tucker's aunt. And I then had conversations with her. I went back and, and we talked several times and she gave me photographs of Aunt Maggie and the house where Tucker um, stopped when he was arguing uh, school deed segregation cases around Virginia or in that area. And um, he would play the piano and um, the little kids, including Sandra, would get to play outside longer. And so she loved it when he came to visit. But I wouldn't have had those pictures if I hadn't been tenacious and curious and followed that path. Yeah.
another path that I didn't expect. Right? The, the chapter on um, his military service was about two paragraphs. It really wasn't a chapter until I followed um, a lead that someone had given to me um, saying that there was a picture of Tucker when he was a lieutenant in the 366th Regiment um, that was formed at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And there's a museum there. So I called the archivist <laughs> and said, I'm looking for this picture, and I think it's a little one, but you know, could you help me out? And she said, well, yeah, there is. Here's the, I've got the yearbook, and it's not a little picture. It's a big picture. So she sent me the digitized large portrait of Tucker when he was first lieutenant you know, in Massachusetts. And then she said, well, you need to also talk to um, Jim Pratt because his father was in Tucker's company. And so I got in touch with Jim Pratt. He found all kinds of morning reports that Tucker had signed when he was the company commander. And then he also got me in touch with um, Frank Cloud, who was uh, living in California, who was also in the, um, in the same company that Tucker, when Tucker was the company commander. And I telephoned him and interviewed him. He was 94 years old at the time, and, and he told me stories about going to, about swimming one afternoon in the Adriatic Sea when they were stationed in Italy. So my military chapter got to be quite long <laughs> and very unexpected. Well, I did a lot of library conferences um, and used my connections um, through um, the Virginia Library Association and um, uh, got in touch with, uh, with uh, librarians from schools around Virginia who invited me to come and do school visits. Um, I did social studies conferences, um, book clubs. Um, I did a presentation at the Arlington Public Library at um, the Black History Museum, Arlington, or Alexandria Public Libraries. Um, but I did a lot of um, promotion myself. And then um, my, my publisher initially um, arranged for me to be on uh, TV, on a couple of you know, TV news shows, and on the Kojo Namdi show. Um, and that was really fun. Right. Um, well, I've been really surprised. Um, we moved uh, back to Minnesota two years ago, and um, I've been very surprised that people outside of this Northern Virginia area have been interested in knowing about the sit-in. Um, people can't believe that it happened so early, and they just want to know more about the story. So I've done, since in the two years that I've been in, in Northfield, Minnesota, I've uh, done presentations at the public library, at the senior center, um, to a homeschool group, um, to some church groups. And there's a group of um, uh, white Northfield residents who are trying to become better advocates for anti-racism and they're listening and learning and um, just trying to do make a difference um, and they invited me to come and speak yeah. yes and another thing that happened that i was totally surprised when either farther afield was um i was contacted by um, a middle school teacher in california whose eighth grade student was um, doing a project for the National History Day, and she wanted to do the Alexandria Library sit-in because the theme that year was breaking barriers. And so she called me and, and interviewed me, and she had a copy of the book, and, and she did a, a, a wonderful project on it. She um, went to the state competition, and she was a finalist in the state. Well, I believe that um, American history is made up of the struggles, the achievements, the contributions of everybody who lived on this land. And if we, um, I, I mean, it's the, 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 the good, the uplifting, 
the the bad, the things that we'd rather not remember. I mean, it's they're uncomfortable, and we could pretend that they didn't happen, but they did happen. And as educators, we would be doing a disservice to students if we didn't tell the full story of American history. Um, I know that we um, we celebrate different groups of Americans different times during the year, and that's wonderful. But I think we have to be careful not to think that, you know, we've done Black History Month, we've done Hispanic Heritage Month, we're, we're finished with that. We don't need to include them anymore. But history is a continuum. And the events that happened earlier um, build, uh, laid the groundwork for things that have happened since. And if we, um, if we don't include everybody's story, um, it's, it's wrong. I think the fact that he never gave up. Um, he had this tenacity that to um, originally, um, one of the things that, that he, he experienced as a child um, was on his grandfather's farm. And um, he heard his father and his grandfather talking. And um, he heard his grandfather say, that's when they Jim Crowed us. And he said from that he knew that segregation wasn't always there, didn't always exist, and it didn't always have to have to be. And it was then that he decided that, you know, something needed to be done about it. So when um, the, he decided to organize the sit-in, he, he recognized that the fact that African Americans in Alexandria could not use the public library, um, he said that's wrong and we must do something about it. I think it's important for kids to know that um, nobody's too young or too old to, to make a difference and to um, seek to change the condition and, and the terms of their lives and the lives of people around them that they care about.